Hello, welcome to the buzz. Spring is making its way into the preserves, but before it completely arrives, our crews are busy prescribed burning the preserves, including Vermont Cemetery Preserve. So we're gonna head there first because now we have a rare look at some gravestones that we didn't see in a previous episode. Then let's explore the new sights, sounds, and even smells that spring is ushering in. It's time to embrace a new season on this episode of The Buzz. back at one of our highest quality prairies, Vermont Cemetery Preserve. You may recall this preserve from an earlier Buzz episode, but it looks a little different. The last time I was here, the plants were high over my head, but it's burn season in the preserves and Vermont Cemetery was on this year's rotation. Today, we're back to see the difference, find more gravestones and dig deeper into their history. Vermont Cemetery Preserve is 37 acres in all, but there is one acre that's incredibly special. This acre was set aside to become a cemetery, meaning it never was transformed for farming, grazing, or development. This left the plants to thrive. It also gives us a look at what the land would have been like back when the American Indians and the early settlers lived here. This type of land is also called a remnant prairie, which illustrates what a true native prairie is. They're a little bit different than our restored prairies. Through restoration, we can turn back time and bring in more diversity, starting with native plants and then watching the wildlife follow. The roots will grow, but they're new and shallow, leaving spaces for the weeds to grow back in. There's also weeds lying dormant in the seedbed, ready to grow at any moment. So it takes a lot of work on our part to keep these at bay. On the other hand, remnant prairies like this one already had diversity in both plants and flora for generations. These plants are established with roots growing 10 feet or even more down below. Now that the preserve has undergone a prescribed burn, we have better access to the gravestones. Joining us to share the history of the families and the people that are buried here is Recreation Coordinator, Jen Guest. Jen, let's start off with, why is this called Vermont Cemetery? Before we start talking about the cemetery itself, I wanted to talk about the land that we're on today. And I want to acknowledge that this is the homeland to the Potawatomi, Miami, Sauk, Fox, and Ho-Chunk Nations. Uh, who traveled and traded here, as well as uh, the many people that are enrolled in tribal communities in Will County. We're standing in the northwest corner of Wheatland Township in Will County. That's where the preserve is located. And this preserve, Vermont Cemetery, is named after the Vermont settlement that was in this area that was established in 1843. Do you know how many people are buried here or how many stones are left? In early times of trying to save the Prairie Cemetery, we know there was about 25 stones or partial stones left in this area. Unfortunately, there was not a fence around the cemetery the whole time since it was originally used as a cemetery. So people have stolen stones, vandalized them, the weather has degraded them over time, and the prairie plants growing up around them had it hidden for a while. Let's head inside and look a little closer at these stones, but before we do, you mentioned there's a fence. There's also rules about our shoes. Can you talk to us more about the precautions we take before entering? Absolutely. So again, we talked about how the fence protects the preserve, not only the headstones that are in there, but really the prairie plants that are so rare that are contained within the cemetery. So we have a perimeter fence all the way around it, and then we need to protect the plants, and that has to do with our shoes. So when you walk through mud, you end up having seeds stuck in your shoes or, or even in the mud, and when you get inside there and it falls off, then those seeds can grow inside. So what we want to do is make sure we have our shoes clean before we enter the preserve. It's really weird being in here with a burn because before the plants were so tall, I feel like we've both tripped and right. fell previously in here. The plants are definitely taller than <laughs> us when they're alive and growing. And it's interesting to know like how far apart the gravestones are. They're not all just kind of in a neat row. So it looks like this stone says Thompson. What do you know about this family? This is Joseph Thompson's grave. He was born in about 1795. He was married to Susan, who was born in about 1800 in Vermont. They had at least six children together, all of whom were born in Vermont. What we're looking at here is Susan Thompson's headstone. She's resting next to her husband, Joseph, we were just talking about. I'm pulling this away a little bit so we can look at it closer, but this is sandstone that her headstone is made out of. And over time, the weather and the rain and the snow and the wind really wears that away, so it gets really hard to read. But I can see an M on here. This uh, probably said March, which was the, the date of her, her death was sometime in March, so. You can still read some of the stuff on the stone, but the weather does uh, do a really good job of eroding that away. So when I first walked up to the stone, I actually thought it was the base for a grave, but I see now it's actually the top of a tombstone. 
it's kind of hard to read, but it says rest in heaven. And there's a little bit of design on here. And if you look over here, there's also the initials CAC. Now I don't have any records that I could find that have any people with those initials CAC. But that's the one hard thing about Vermont Cemetery is we don't have very good records. The records for the cemetery were lost way before the Forest Preserve District took over Vermont Cemetery. So we've used places like genealogy.com and find a grave and different things like that to help us figure out who actually is buried here. But in this case, I'm just not sure who this is because I don't have anyone with the initials CAC. This is Emergency T. Hayward. She was born in 1836 and she passed away in 1861. She was from New York. She was married to a man named Labian Hayward. They had several children together, one of which we know Clara was buried in Vermont Cemetery. We don't see a headstone for her today, but in records it shows that she was buried here along with her mother. So the gravestones we're looking at right now are a little different than the ones we saw before. What we have right here is actually a family plot for the Book family. You may recognize the name Book as a road that goes through the Naperville area. John Book was born in 1803 in Germany. He was married twice and had eight children. Prior to moving to the U.S., John had a first wife named Margaret Catherine Scheibler. They had three children together. Margaret was born and died in Germany, so she's not buried in Vermont Cemetery. After John's first wife passed away, he married a second time, also got married in Germany to a lady named Margaretha Schorla. They were married for 30 years and had five children together. This is the grave of John's second wife, Margaret. Inside the book burial plot, you'll see a few other parts of tombstones in here. One is the word father. That would have been for John Book. It would have been on top of someone's gravestone at one point. So we definitely know that some of the stones are missing from this family plot. Another person we know that was buried in the cemetery was Rila Book, which was another one of their grandchildren. This is the grave site of Johann Jacob Book. He was born in Germany in 1835. This is his final resting spot here in Vermont Cemetery. If you look at his gravestone, you can see it says Jacob. That's what he went by. It's a son of J and C Book. And that's really interesting because we know this is John's son and both his wife's name were Margaret or Marguerite, but his first wife's middle name was Catherine. So we think that the J and the C stands for John and Catherine Book. He arrived in North America in 1847, according to immigration documents. This is the grave site of William, Anne, and Elizabeth Kenley. Now this is a really interesting uh, headstone. This one has been redone. This is not the original headstone that was at Vermont Cemetery. This one's made out of granite, and you can see that it's much bigger. It's, it's actually the biggest headstone in all of Vermont Cemetery. You might think it's interesting that he has both his wives listed on here, but that's probably because this was a reproduced stone. William Kinley was born in the Isle of Man. He was first married to Anne Allen Kinley, and she also was from the Isle of Man. She lived until she was about 50 years of age. After William's first wife passed away, he got remarried. His second wife's name is down here, Elizabeth Ashley. She was born in Nova Scotia, Canada, and she's also buried here in Vermont Cemetery. Charles Kinley was born in Nova Scotia in 1821 and the son of William Kinley, who was a farmer. Mr. Kinley was brought up on his father's farm and engaged in farming throughout his life. He came to Will County in 1843 and settled on the present homestead with his father and mother and children. He married Miss Mary Vincent, born in Prince Edward Island. Mr. Charles Kinley was a man who was loved and honored by his fellow man. He died June 1861, leaving a state of 200 acres of land, which has been made by hard labor and good management to his wife and five children. This is all according to the 1878 History of Will County book. On the stone here, you can see his name, John Graba, born March 28th, 1828, which you'll notice that there's no death date. We can find no records of John's death or that he's buried in Vermont Cemetery. We do know that his wife, Wilhelmine, was buried here in Vermont Cemetery. Wilhelmine was previously married to Johannes Slapp in 1856. Johannes immigrated in 1863 from Hamburg, Germany. We don't know his fate after he arrived to Chicago. We do know Wilhelmine married John Graba at some point between 1863 and 1875. She had at least two children with Johannes Slapp and six children with John Groba. Philip Steedbolt is buried here in Vermont Cemetery near his only daughter, Wilhelmine Graba. You may also notice on his tombstone here, there is a finger pointing up. Usually when there's a finger on a tombstone like that, it's pointing up towards heaven. This one is in particular pointing to a book. There's a good chance this is a Bible 
Um, and also it looks like it had some sort of verse or saying on it. So the, the finger was also pointing to whatever was in the book. Vermont Cemetery Preserve is more than meets the eye. It's a true native prairie and can also transport us back in time. Because of the recent prescribed burns, we can easily see the gravestones that were once covered by six foot tall vegetation. This is a great time to visit the preserve to see how many stones you can spot. Now you can't go inside the fenced area, but you can still see the cemetery from along the trail. And make sure to keep checking in to see the plants do their thing. Come summer, you'll see tall grass and colorful blooms. Do you want to do more to protect nature, inspire discovery, and connect people with the great outdoors? You can when you support the Nature Foundation of Will County. This nonprofit charity raises funds through support from donors, organizations, and the business community to help support the Forest Preserve District of Will County's mission. The foundation helps various initiatives take flight. It helps the Forest Preserve secure national touring exhibitions. It pays for new amenities such as campground welcome stations and bike repair stations on Will County's regional trails. It assists with the costs associated with land stewardship, which includes equipment for volunteer workdays and seeding of native plants to restore the land to its original state, which helps enhance not only your outdoor experiences, but local wildlife as well. There's a lot more work to be done, and we're just getting started. Roll with us on this adventure and become a champion for nature, so future generations can appreciate and explore everything Mother Nature has to offer. Donate today at willcountynature.org. avid hunter or an experienced birder to recognize the duck with the shiny green head. Mallards are pretty widespread across the globe. They can live in any kind of wetland area, including artificial and natural water bodies. So since they're all around us, let's get a little bit more acquainted with the mallards by learning five fascinating facts about these dapper ducks. Like many ducks, the male and female look very different. Male mallards, also called drakes, have the iridescent green heads with bright yellow bills, a white ring around their neck, and dark brown bodies. The females, also called hens, are mottled brown and tan all over. Both sexes have a bright blue speculum patch on their wings that you can see when they take flight. Male and female mallards look different, but they also sound different. The females may not be winning any awards in the best dress category, but they do get top marks in the sound category. The classic quack of a duck comes from a female mallard. The female will do this decrescendo call of two to 10 quacks, starting with a really loud one and getting shorter and softer as they call. Males
males make a quieter, raspier two note call, or they can make a rattling sound when they take their beak and rub it against their flight feathers in a special display for their lady. Mallards have a three foot wingspan and can fly up to 55 miles per hour. Now, not all mallards migrate because if they have enough food and shelter, then they'll stick around all winter long. But if they do migrate, they can fly up to 800 miles within eight hours. Now, after an intense flight like that, they will have to rest for a week before traveling again. Females will build a nest on the ground using different plant materials and their own breast feathers. In urban areas, don't be surprised if you find them in weird places like parking lots or in flower pots. She will lay six to 14 eggs and spend a month on the nest incubating. After they hatch, it will only take 24 hours for these little birds to hit the water. Mallards are dabbling ducks. Have you ever seen a duck with its tail feather sticking straight out and it's just bobbing in the water? Well, this is a feeding strategy that they can either skim the surface of the water for food or tip their whole bodies down to get underwater plants or snatch an aquatic insect. Their food includes a variety of different plants or snails and even a tasty earthworm. When it's on land, they can eat agriculture, grains, and seeds. Mallards are easy to find and observe, so head to your local wetland or pond to see if you can catch that emerald green head or the female's loud quack, 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 quack. And if you have a wetland or pond in your backyard, consider building a nesting structure so you can see the life cycle play out right before your eyes. Head to nestwatch.org for mallard plans and tons of other bird structures to bring nature into your backyard. In the Midwest, we experience all the seasons, including some transition periods. Just when you think spring is here, boom, another snowstorm hits. But I'm here to say spring has arrived because nature is leaving us clues that the snooze button is off. Today, we'll explore the native sights, sounds, and even smells that mark the season. Even if you can't get outside to see the changes, you could be noticing that the days are getting longer. Another sign of spring is a return of some of our feathery friends, the most popular being American Robins. These birds have been long associated with spring's arrival, but actually they can be here all year long. In the winter, we just don't see them that much because they're high in the trees roosting and looking for berries to hold them over. Come spring, the worms are easier to get from the thawed ground. The robins will return to our yards and neighborhoods. In our area, a more migratory harbinger of spring is a red-winged blackbird. These birds are considered short distant migrants because they overwinter as close as the southern part of Illinois. But come early March, I'll see these birds come in and show their red wing patches and make a lot of noise. Males come first claiming their territory and letting everyone know about it. If you or an animal gets too close, they'll puff up making them as big as possible, flashing their red color on their wings they can call and heckle and make a lot of noise. And if all that still doesn't work, they can even swoop down and escort you out of their space. I've experienced this personally as I was hiking a trail and the only way I could continue was to take a detour, making a wide berth around a red-winged blackbird that was hopping and following me to make sure I got the message. Red-winged blackbirds can be spotted in marshy areas with tall grasses and cattails. They can also be seen in prairies, along roadsides and in fields. They'll sit up on a high perch and call out conqueree. And then a few weeks later, when the females arrive, they'll respond with a little ch, -ch, -ch, -ch. Morning doves have a more soulful song. It always transports me back to when I was young, waking up at my grandparents' house and hearing the call over and over again outside the window. So much so, I had to figure out who was making it. Unmated males will perch up somewhere in full view to make a loud hoo 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 once they're nested, they shorten the call to make more of a hoo-hoo, just to check in. This song can be confused for the hoots of an owl, but remember, owls tend to call at night, where morning doves tend to call during the morning or during the day. In a previous Buzz episode, we learned that the black-capped chickadees will sing its name during the wintertime. Chickadee-dee-dee. It adds more of those D notes, the more that they're alarmed. But in the spring, the males switch to a more sweeter tune. Now they're saying, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. 
sweetie. You will also hear the percussion section join the spring chorus. Woodpeckers, like the downy woodpecker all the way to the large pileated woodpecker, are drumming on trees to show their love. And it's not just trees. It could also be something like metal trash cans or your chimney. Both males and females rapidly drum, and you can start telling the difference of species depending on how quickly the drumming pace is. But don't be fooled. The smallest downy woodpecker can find the perfect hollow tree to sound like the biggest bird in the forest. Birds aren't the only ones singing a spring song. If you hike near a wetland or a juicy ditch, chances are you're gonna be hearing this high-pitched, thrilling song. This song belongs to boreal chorus frogs, and it's the male singing, trying to serenade the females to join them in the wetland. These frogs are much easier to hear than see. They're only about the size of a quarter. They are solitary and spend most of their time hidden throughout the rest of the year. They're part of the tree frog family, and they even have little suction cups on their toes, but they aren't really found in trees. They have stripes on the side of their body and three stripes down their back. It kind of reminds me of lines on sheet music, ready for the chorus to sing. Another sound you'll hear in this wetland is a high-pitched peep, peep, peep. This sound belongs to another frog called spring peepers. They've got a perfect name because they're one of the first to call in the spring, and instead of a song, they make more of a peep. They're also small with the chorus frogs, but instead of having lines on their back, they have an X on their back. Spring is not only when the animals become more active, but also the plants. It's a perfect time for the forest wildflowers to burst from the ground to bloom while there's no leaves on the trees. You may also hear these plants called spring ephemerals. An ephemeral means that they only bloom for a brief amount of time before they lay dormant waiting for the next spring season to arrive. So there's a lot of things on the ground. I'm keeping my eye out for the small harbinger of spring. That's always hard to find. Bloodroot. And I see some like spring beauties mixed in, but none of them are quite open yet. I want to make sure we find a nice open patch. Of course, I'm seeing a lot of other stuff starting to grow. There's some toothworts, just not open yet. What's amazing is how much diversity is in one small little pocket. The first flower that blooms in spring is called Harbinger of Spring. It's a small, tiny flower, and it's very easy to miss. So looking on the forest floor, I challenge you, can you find it? Harbinger of Spring is probably one of the tiniest flowers we have. Uh, it's so small that you could easily step over it, step on it. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you probably would never even notice it. It blooms from March through April, and as it starts, the anthers hold really dark pink pollen. And as it ages, it will turn more of a black, giving this plant a nickname called salt and pepper. Another early bloomer is a sharp-lobed hepatica. This is also called a liver leaf because the leaves look and have the same color as a liver. This is related to a theory called the doctrine of signatures, saying if an herb looks like a body part, then it could be used to treat that part. However, I don't think hepatica did much for the liver. My favorite thing about hepatica is when it first blooms, the stems are super hairy. They also can be in so many different colors, from white to pink to purple and all in between. When you look closer at the flower, you'll notice that these petals aren't actually petals, they're colored sepals. And the sepals are usually the leaves that hold a traditional flower's petal. Spring Beauty is a flower that loves the sun. It will stay closed at night or on cloudy days, but here on a sunny day, it opens up and follows the sun as it travels across the sky. These little flowers are about the size of my fingernail and they can dapple throughout the whole forest floor. They can be white or more pink as they have little pink lines on their petals. The anthers also have bright pink pollen, so sometimes you'll find bees sprinkled in pink as they pollinate. Out of all these flowers, my absolute favorite is bloodroot. And I think I love it so much because it's all about the chase to see it when it's blooming on the exact day. The actual bloom period only lasts about two weeks and each individual plant will bloom for one or two days. When they start off, these leaves are really tightly around the stem and as they bloom, they start opening up. 
They have like a squiggly hand pattern and will stay around even when the flower's long gone. These veins are kind of reddish. It's called blood root because if you break open some of these veins or even down below in the root, it oozes a blood red sap. Spring has many sights and sounds, but some would argue it even has a smell. We've all heard the phrase, April showers bring May flowers, but those showers also bring this familiar smell back to us. Petrichor is the smell associated with the rain, and it all starts in the soil with a particular bacteria that makes a special chemical compound called geosmin. When the rain hits the soil, that compound is released in the air and gets to our nostrils. The smell is associated with the springtime because that's when it first emerges after being absent all winter long. It's such a popular smell that it's even used in candles and perfumes. Another smell I notice when hiking in the springtime is the smell of onions. And it's not a taco truck parked in the parking lot, it's actually all these green plants you see all around me. These are called wild leeks and they're a type of onion and when you step on them or crunch the leaves, they really give you that strong sense of a cilantro kind of smell. Wild leeks are edible, but remember, it's illegal to harvest anything out of the forest preserves. Spring is a fantastic time to start a habit to get outside. The birds are back in town singing their songs, the frogs are in the wetlands singing their own love songs, and plants are bursting through the ground with colorful blooms. The most important thing about spring is that it constantly changes, so make sure you get out every week to catch something new. Spring is all about renewal, whether it's plants growing after a prescribed burn or the spring ephemerals bursting through the ground for their time in the sun. It's also a great time to get outside, so make sure you map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find preserve information or register for a program to learn about the history, the sounds, the sights, and even the smells of the preserves. I hope to see you out soaking up the spring vibes, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.